Well, good morning again. It's great to see you here this morning. And we are, as Charles said, we're going to just kind of change track a little bit. We're going to transition from a summer of salvation, looking at salvation from really every possible angle I could fit into a summer series to now actually living the life living the life, living the life of faith. In this shorter series that will culminate on the 11th, Sunday the 11th, which is our our friends and family day, our potluck day, where we uh, have just a wonderful wonderful time together. We'll have a combined Bible class, by the way. I need to make sure you know that on the 11th. We'll obviously worship together, have a big meal together. We'll have a congregational meeting with some really great updates on the building program that we want you to uh, praise God for. And then we'll uh, be gone for the rest of the day and, and hopefully have some good family time. Uh, that is where we are going with all of this. Next week, as we look at this lesson series, today we're looking at being faithful to the end, faithful unto death. Next week, we are going to look at how to be faithful when you are discouraged. That's a very necessary and needy type of lesson that we all need to to learn uh, at a time in our life when perhaps we are not feeling encouraged or not as faithful as we want to be. So those are the types of things we're going to be looking at. Now, since this is the transition into Lesson 1, Living a Life of Faith, I want to remind you of what was just read and something that I read to you this morning, that the Bible shows us that our life with God, our life in His Son's church, in this life, it is called a race. We just got done with the Olympics. I don't know about you, but I just love the track and field portions. I love the the drama. I love the incredible speed of, uh, of these men and women. Very wonderful things, but I was always uh, amazed at how easily people lost by just fractions of a second or just the mishandling of the baton, the stick, or handed off, Americans found, handing it off just one millisecond too late and then be disqualified uh, in their race. It just shows that this idea that life is a race isn't uh, an easy thing to live out, obviously. The Bible tells us that it's a race that is laid out for us. Paul told us that. Laid out. It is a track, a direction, a, a map that we must negotiate. Paths, the road, however you wish to look at it. We are told that we, it's not just about running the race, it is finishing the race. Be, uh, you need to finish what you begin, right? The reason that uh, we must finish it is because even Paul wrote that, that he doesn't even want to be disqualified for the prize. Disqualified. And so this metaphor is something we can completely understand. Now we can take the metaphors away or, or maybe just kind of kind of work our way out of the metaphors. It is true. I've seen it. I think you've seen it. And you and I can have lived through uh, this where sometimes we quit the race. We stop running. We pull back. We don't give it everything that we've got. We can leave, go so far as to leave the race, leave the life of faith, leave Jesus' church and forfeit or just give up the prize that Jesus called us heavenward to give us as we just heard. Now you can see that the metaphor uh, talks about the race, but also it talks about when we don't live and run the race and give it everything that we have. Now another thing about the race is that this is true as well, that some won't even get on the track. Some are just content with, although they are called to run in the race, they are content just to sit and watch the race from the bleachers and still think that somehow God will have a crown for me too. 
have a trophy, have a prize for me too. And all I can think to say in that is, I don't think so. That's not what the Bible teaches. My friends, this is a big deal. Running the race and finishing the course. This is our life. This is what the Lord has called us to be. Listen to these words. These words from James chapter 1, verse 12. These are the words of Jesus' brother James. James wrote, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Again, it is, it is a life that must be lived, and it is a trial to undergo. It is a test to, uh, to undergo and come out okay. The book of Revelation, we hear from the risen Christ. He said, Revelation 2.10, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Those are the words of the resurrected Christ. How about Paul's words to the Corinthian church? 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. The Bible says, Do you not know that all in, or do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. And that is a very mature and healthy way to live your life. Live your life for the prize, which is heaven, which is eternal life. Paul told the Philippian church, as we just got done hearing, Paul said, Press on toward the goal to win the price for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. God calls us to heaven and to receive that prize, but we must Press on toward that goal. Run that race. Go through the life. Live out the life of faith to the end. The life of faith to the end. All right, so these words that were written that I just read to you are words that were written by James, wrote, words spoken by Jesus, uh, words um, written down by Paul. And these words were written to Christians who, number one, were either unfaithful or uh, just maybe living on the periphery, you know, just kind of hanging on the outside, not really being involved or in the race. Uh, some, they were addressed to those who were walking away or who have left the race, their life with Christ. And it was also written to the faithful so that they would stay with what they've got. Keep going. Don't stop. You're doing well. So no matter who you are, these words, this lesson, is for all of us to learn. We must all understand that we must be faithful to the end. We must be faithful for life. And this is the life that God has called us heavenward. And this is our race right here. All right. About 750 years or so, before Jesus was born and lived and preached, the prophet Joel uh, wrote these words. He wrote, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is an often used passage in the New Testament in apostolic preaching. Uh, Peter used it uh, in, in the great sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost. That's a message that everyone needs to hear. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But the Son of God, not just a prophet, but the prophet, obviously, the Son of God, Jesus, clarified this prophecy by telling His disciples, and we are His disciples, He who stands firm to the end will be saved. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. That gives us the clarity, not just to the, the salvation that God wants to give those who call out to Him, save me, but you must live the life. It's not just the asking. It is also the living, living this life. So today we learn about how to be faithful to the end. I want you to open to Jude. Jude. Jude 17. It's one of those small books, only one chapter. It's just a note.
just a, a brief letter that the brother of Jesus wrote. It's a general letter written to the churches. The book of Jude. As I said, Jude is the brother of Jesus, and what he wrote here was a really hard-hitting letter because there were some things going on in the churches that were either driving Christians away or leading them away from Christ. False teachers had infiltrated. They were teaching things that were anti-apostolic, which, mean, which means they were trying to overteach or teach against what Paul or Peter say were teaching and writing and preaching for the churches to understand, for the Gentile and Jewish Christians to understand and live. And so as they were being pulled away or, or pushed away with this teaching, what they were doing is they were moving toward living sinful, worldly lives. They were leaving the race that leads to eternal life and they were veering off and going into sinful lives. That's why he wrote the letter. So what did he do? In the letter, the whole letter, you can read it in just a few minutes. It's, it's, uh, it's not long to read. And in this letter, he condemns the teachers for what they are teaching. And I guess by extension, what they are not teaching. He condemned the teachers, but he also gave the Christians that heard this read in the assembly... He gave the Christians the way to live a faithful life, a faithful life all the way to the end. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we remain faithful to the end? I want you to stop for a second. And I don't know everyone's story or everyone's deal. I just don't. You don't know mine either. But I know for a fact I can speak to people that I know or I can speak about myself. I know that I have been tempted seemingly from the day I was immersed to the point I am now. There's always a temptation to veer away from Christ, to make things about myself, to leave biblical truth or to whitewash biblical truth or to do things my way rather than God's way or to just simply be lazy and not really give the, the, the race, the, the, the exertion that it needs living my life for Christ. But I've also known people. Some of the biggest heartaches I have ever felt in my entire life are people that began with Christ, that I taught and helped them find Christ and find salvation and find just simple church and simple Christianity and walk away from it all. And it just tears a person's heart out when they leave the race and go back to the world. It doesn't have to happen. I don't know where you are, but maybe you feel yourself veering off or not really in the race, or maybe you've never even got set foot on the track and started the race uh, in your life. But there are ways that we can be this faithful person. We must be faithful to the end. The first thing I want you to understand this, the first way, the first rule, if you will, on living faithful lives all the way to the end Remain faithful no matter what others are doing. It is so easy to be pulled off. It is so easy to be led away by Satan, by the world, by our lusts, by our worldly desires. Listen to what Jude wrote, verse 17. 17 through 19. Dear friends... Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. In the first century, later in the first century, there were, there were already the, the beginnings of people leaving the simple apostolic truth, the words that Jesus gave to the apostles to teach and to save souls with, leaving the gospel, leaving that, that simple message. They were being pulled off into, into to silly arguments about things that do not matter, that were not biblical. They were leaving biblical truth 
And all it was doing was hurting people. It was taking people away from Christ, taking them out of the fight and away from the race that would lead them to eternal life. Now, haven't you ever found that it's quite easy to follow someone away from faith? Maybe it's happened to you. I don't know, maybe it's happening to you now. But it does happen. It's easy to follow someone away from faith. It's not that hard to be pulled away from faith, especially with good-sounding words or or from sweet people or even well-meaning people or even just pulled away from the life that you are embroiled in that seems to captivate you and you live for that life rather than living for Christ unbelievers or negative or disgruntled Christians or the biblically ignorant can have a lot of influence on our lives and just the call of the world that calls us every day to be like the world. All of these things can turn us away from Christ. They can lead us away from His church. They can can fog biblical truth where it's not quite as true as I once thought it was. And so Jude wrote that the apostles warned us about all this. To remember the things that they taught, the things that they told us. And he's just simply reminding them of the things that they had learned about the world, about divisive people, about those people in the world, but also in the church. And as Jesus put it, even our own families can pull us away from a life of following Jesus as his disciple. So his word is watch out. Watch out. Be ready. Don't be fooled. Remain faithful no matter what everyone else is doing. Doesn't matter what others are doing. It matters what you do. And we are responsible for ourselves. You know, since we can't always be free from this influence, what in the world do we do? What do we do when we, are, when we are influenced in this way? We must stand firm no matter what you see, no matter what others are doing. And this can be a very lonely way to live, believe me. If you, might, you might be in a family or, or in a workplace or in some type of environment where you feel as though or you know you are the only one trying to live for Christ to be a person of the Word, a person of the Spirit, and to be faithful and righteous and holy in your life. And you don't get much encouragement. And it's a hard way to live. This is where we have to make the hard choices. I will live for Christ regardless of what the people, I, the way the other people or people that I love are going to live. I must live for Christ I must stay in the race. So remain in the race. Remain faithful uh, regardless of what other people are doing. The second thing is this. Remain faithful to spiritual discipline. Remain faithful to spiritual discipline. There's a certain life that we adopt. There are certain ways that we must grow. Certain things we adopt into our life that will keep us faithful. And if we don't live those out, if we don't utilize those things, then we have a better chance of being pulled away or led away from the race. Verse 20. Verse 20. This is what the text says. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. And pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Well, that's just a few little words there, but they are so meaty in what we can, in, in the things that, that we can learn. First of all, you build yourself up in, uh, in faith and you pray in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? My friends, spiritual disciplines. And how you build yourself up are vital in faith. The spiritual disciplines. There are things like worship. If you want to run the race, you better be a person of worship. And that now, now that uh, implies with the body. Number two, give. A discipline of giving and being a generous giver. God has given, so we give. Or the discipline of study, constantly 
uh, in the Word. I heard another person today said, I just started reading the Bible over and I'm already seeing things I've never even noticed. And they're so excited. It's like reading the Bible anew. And I know this person's probably read the Bible a hundred times through studying the Bible. Serving is another one of those disciplines, always being a person of service. These are the disciplines that build up our faith and build up the body as well as we do all this together. But our strength comes from prayer. It comes from prayer in the Holy Spirit. And what that means is our prayers are are under the influence, the guidance, and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in that relationship where God gives us uh, His Spirit as an earnest, as a down payment, guaranteeing what is to come. From that standpoint, as a Spirit-filled person, my prayers are going to be are going to be spiritual prayers because I have a relationship with God and God's Spirit is with me. Have you ever wondered why you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you are immersed into Him? It's so you can be a person of prayer when life is a mess, so you can be faithful when everyone around you, it seems like, isn't faithful at all. We must be, in, uh, be this type of person. So what we do then is we keep ourselves in God's love and mercy as we wait for His reward. That is being patient. Because God loves me and because of His mercy toward me, I am going to wait until uh, you know, in His time He brings me to be with Him and all these challenges will be over. I'm going to wait for God. Be patient with God and be patient with His timing all the way to the end. So remain faithful to spiritual discipline. Grow in these disciplines of worship and prayer and giving and study and service. Grow in these. You will be stronger when you are a servant. And that brings us to number three. Remain faithful in compassionate ministry. Remain faithful in compassionate ministry. Now, in this, these, this uh, uh, passage here, it's not the, the general that we normally think of, of compassionate ministry of loving the widows and the orphans and taking care of them. No, it's having a heart that just aches for people who are stuck in the world and people who are lost and people who are disoriented. And they don't know where they're going. They're, they're so um, pulled and, 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 and hurt by Satan that they have no clue what to do. What do we do? We point them to Christ. We rescue them from that type of life. Listen to these words. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. What does that mean? If we are going to run the race we must be concerned about people who are lost. That is another discipline that we all need to grow in, all of us. If you are not serving, you will never be as strong as you can be. If you are not concerned about those who are spiritually, eternally lost, you will never ever be as thankful as you must be thankful for what you have received. And so servants are stronger. Those who serve and those who are embroiled into the the lives of people around them to help them, regardless of what they do, you can't live like they do, but we must care and help, snatch, teach. I mean, all those uh, show mercy, save, go into the fire to get them without allowing them to influence us to live that life. And so what should we do in the name of the Lord? Be merciful to the doubters. Don't mock them. Don't judge them. Because there go we at a time or two in our life, I think. Uh, But we pull the unfaithful back to God. And we keep ourselves pure in that whole process. How does this keep us faithful? How does this help us be faithful to the end? I want you to know that that right there shows that your Christianity is not about you. It's about God and it's about the lost. We finally get it that Christianity is not about me and my comfort and my salvation and and everything perfect for me. 
when I realize it's not perfect for everyone else and I try to do something about it, that is when I show the greatest appreciation and have the greatest strength that I'll ever have. Remain faithful in compassionate ministry. One more. Remain faithful to the one who helps you. Remain faithful to the one who helps you. Verse 24 says, To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Now I know this is kind of redundant. It's, it's circular reasoning and that's okay. It works. We must remain faithful to God or to remain faithful to God, you must be faithful to God. There's no better way to put it. There's no other way that I can, you know, in my limitations, can think to put that. To remain faithful to God, you must, be re you must remain faithful to God. That is the life that we are supposed to live. And so we stay faithful to the one who helps us by his powers. Look, the text says, by his glory, majesty, power, and authority through his son, by that power exhibited through Christ, we will be able to stay faithful to the one who's there to help us make it through. Stay faithful to the one who is helping you live this life. So that means when you're down, when you're discouraged, when you're beat up, maybe you're backsliding, going backwards in your faith. No matter what your deal is, your issue is, or your struggle is, no matter what it is, stay with God. My friends, listen to me. The worst thing you can ever do is when you get mad, or when you are upset, or you are discouraged, is to walk away from Christ, His church, and His truth. That's the worst thing you can do. The worst. We need to stay with our Lord no matter what, all the way to the end. He'll help you work through it. I expect there's people here today that know exactly what I'm talking about. You might have felt every one of those ways at one time or another, but you didn't walk away and you stayed with it, and the Lord brought you through. That's the promise that He makes to help us. We have to run the race to the end, live the life of faith to the end, and He will be with us to the end. He will be with us to the end when we meet Him in heaven. So here's what I want you to think about as, we're, as we conclude. Life in the first century church was far more difficult than our life today. Now, I know that's changing. And I know for some, they're making that, that first century type of stand for Christ. I understand that. But my friends, I don't think any of us have been persecuted to the point of blood, as, as the Bible tells us. And so, I'm not trying to say that we don't have excuses, but I am here to tell you that we really don't have any good excuses not to be faithful to the end. Things are changing and I get it. But I think the persecution that we're going through is not like the first century. I think the problems that we face in the church today and in, and in Christianity today are not because of the persecution but because we're trying to have two masters and live two different ways instead of completely for Christ all the way. Instead of that, I want that but I still don't want to give up all of this, all of that. And we try to have it both ways. There's no single-minded devotion to the degree where we will stay with Christ all the way because it's the most important thing to us, having two masters. So to be faithful to the end, we must turn away from the sinful world. So if, you're, so if your heart is turning... Well, actually, Hebrews 3... Hebrews chapter 3, it's on the screen. Hebrews 3, 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, 
so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. I, I, that, that verse right there is important into this, uh, in this topic because we do have a responsibility to one another. I don't save you. I didn't die for you. But I must help you. You didn't save me and you didn't die for me. But I need your help to look out for me. Notice when I'm gone. Notice if there's something amiss. Notice if my countenance has fallen. We look out after one another. That's what we do because the Bible says the faithful church wants to be, is to be held up to the Lord. We together. So we must help one another in this. We can be faithful to the end if we can do it together with the Lord helping us, with the Spirit and His Word guiding us and blessing us. We can live faithful lives all the way to the end. So if your heart has turned away, As your friend, I counsel you to turn back. If your heart seems to be starting that turn, I counsel you with the same thing. Stop and think where that leads. It doesn't lead anywhere good, and it doesn't lead to heaven. Stay with Christ and make the daily struggle. We will help you. Let us help you. And if we can help you right now in any way, come forward as we stand and sing.